Okay, remember that they are changing my voice. This is Revelation 9 now. A key part of Revelation 9 is verse 20, where it says, The rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues still did not repent of the work of their hands. They did not stop worshiping demons. Okay? And we'll see that again as a recurring theme. They keep refusing to repent, and then the end comes. That's how we know the world is done once and for all. Because this wasn't just a brief punishment, no. It was a punishment that transforms the world into a place where no righteousness and justice can be lived, can be done. You can't walk in the way of righteousness along the path of justice after my flesh dies. The principles do not allow for it. So Revelation 9 verse 1. The fifth angel sounded his trumpet, and I saw a star that had fallen from the sky to the earth. The star was given the key to the shaft of the abyss. This seems to connect to, okay, the fourth angel, right? The stars, are a third of the stars are struck. It also connects to um, the third angel, where there's a great star blazing like a torch falling from the sky on a third of the rivers and the springs of water. So the rivers and the water, right? The water stands for the sea of people. We'll see that in Revelation 17. So that star is... It may as well be the devil if it's not the devil. It's certainly um, something that has fallen out of the sky all ablaze in trouble. That's one way to interpret it, okay? Bring in trouble and turning the water into evil as it's, 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 you know, full of evil. It's resonating with evil. Evil is coming off it. And it's give, given the key to the shaft of the abyss. And that's not good. When, when he opened the abyss, smoke rose from it like the smoke from a gigantic furnace. Remember, Jerusalem is said to be the furnace and Zion the fire. We see that in Isaiah 31, 7. Let's just talk about that briefly here. Return, you Israelites, to the one you, ha you have so greatly revolted against. For in that day, every one of you will reject the idols of silver and gold your sinful hands have made. Assyria will fall by no human sword. A sword not of mortals will devour them. They will flee before the sword, and their young men will be put to forced labor. Their stronghold will fall because of terror at the sight of the battle standard. Their commanders will panic, declares the Lord, whose fire is in Zion, whose furnace is in Jerusalem. Again, Zechariah 12 shows us that the war spirit of the idea that Judah is superimposed on has the fire in them. Has the fire in it, that war spirit. The idea used here is something more pure than what the spirit of the flesh-based tribe is. So the idea of the war spirit of God, the fire of the war spirit, is more pure than you'll see in any, any flesh-based group, you know, out there. The war spirit is something that you can see in me if you are paying close attention, and it's nowhere else, okay? It's something more pure than what you see in church, your mosques, your synagogues, anywhere else part of why they fume and poison me to try to confuse you about this okay so back to Revelation 9 and out of the smoke locusts came down on the earth and were given power like that of scorpions on earth scorpions of the earth they were told not to harm the grass or the earth or any plant or tree but only those people who did not have the seal of God on their foreheads so we see in Zechariah and elsewhere the locusts refer to people, they refer to officials, they refer to merchants. It's basically the spirits of wicked people plundering the earth, reducing them further as they reduce themselves. And the key part is here is that they're told not to harm the grass, not to harm the righteousness and the righteous, okay, but only those people who did not have the seal of God on their foreheads, those people who did not dedicate their mind, body, soul, and spirit to God. They were not allowed to kill them, but only to torture them for five months. Again, this is figurative, the five months. And the agony they suffered was like that of the sting of a scorpion when it strikes. During those days, people will seek death, but will not find it. They will long to die, but death will elude them. The locusts look like horses prepared for battle. Remember, Judah is said to be a proud horse, and the locusts stand for the spirits of people. Okay, so this is, it partially has to do with the Jews and the people the Jews are superimposed on. Okay plundering the world as part of the wrath of God and obviously God doesn't approve of them doing it because they're supposed to scramble and do what's right so they don't get a magic pass to do so okay the locusts look like horses prepared for battle on their heads they wore something like crowns of gold and their faces resembled human faces 
Their hair was like women's hair and their teeth was like lion's teeth. They had breastplates like breastplates of iron and the sound of their wings was like the thundering of many horses and chariots rushing into battle. So there we have the word thundering like we see in uh, Revelation 7 I made, excuse me, not Revelation 7, on the seventh seal in Revelation 8 that I talked about in a few chapters, uh, a few videos before this, okay? So the sound they're making was a thundering noise, okay? It was like the thundering of many horses and chariots rushing into battle. It's that war spirit that the thunder and the lightning and the hail, etc., refer to. And also, we see in the Old Testament that when God was speaking through the war spirit, God's voice is said to have thundered to Moses and the Israelites. They had tails with stingers, like scorpions, and in their tails they had the power to torment people for five months. They had as king over them the angel of the abyss, the abyss whose name in Hebrew is Abaddon, and in Greek is Apollyon. Now we see Apollo takes on certain solar aspects in Greek mythology, okay? So Apollyon actually does refer to Apollo, who's a deity of knowledge and technology, right? They're not supposed to eat from the tree of knowledge, and ha as they did, as they continued to sin and, and pretend that they were important, right? As the snake was telling them that they can be like gods if they use psychology and propaganda and theater arts and, you know, national ideas, globalist ideas and pretend instead of living universal pinpoint and moral precision. So Apollo is, is an idolatrous idol, right? It's, it's a false, uh, false god, you know, who's a destroyer because he's also confusing you about the nature of the sun, which is the symbol of the bridegroom. If you look at Apollo's statues, you can tell that Apollo's not a warrior deity. He's a deity of science and knowledge and technology, okay? And arts and poetry, especially where they overlap with those things. He's also very similar to Dionysus, who's said to be a young Zeus, okay? And a, a deity of ritual madness, theater arts, religious ecstasy, etc. So when Apollo kind of seizes the earth, right, that brain hacking, that the matrix, if you will, the technology, the, the unnatural altering of the earth, it destroys the earth. There's no way back. It changes the course of the inhabitants of the earth uh, along with their wickedness and the injustice and the generational ill-gotten gains and the other things that the Bible uh, was warning people about, etc. Okay. The first woe is past. Two other woes are yet to come.